Welcome to PTSD 911 Presents. We're so glad you decided to join us today for this special interview with our special guest who I'll introduce in just a minute. My name is Conrad Weaver. I'm your host for this program, and I'm also the director of PTSD 911, the documentary film. I want to tell you just briefly about the film in case you don't know much about it. So we decided to produce this, this film that tells the story of first responders who are dealing with and often suffering from the effects of post-traumatic stress. You know, we have three goals for our film. The first is to raise awareness, to let the general public know about first responders who are dealing with this issue. I believe that it's important to have more support for our first responder community. And through this film, we wanna, wanna build that support by raising awareness about these things. The second goal that we have for our film is to, is to make it okay to not be okay, to really break down that stigma of asking for help. We believe it is important for all first responders to have the ability to have the willingness to have the fortitude to raise their hand when things aren't going so well. And so, and to be able to make that less of a stigma so that first responders can ask for help without threat of losing their job or of, of uh, being ridiculed by their coworkers. We believe it's so important to be able to ask for help. The third thing we wanna do with this film is to inspire change in agencies. There are still agencies out there who still have the suck it up buttercup mentality and that needs to change. And we wanna help agencies by showing agencies who are doing it well and doing it right. And we've discovered some amazing people, some amazing leaders in the first responder community who are doing just that. And one of those leaders is our guest tonight, Patrick J. Kinney is a, has been a member of the fire service for more than 38 years and he retired in january of this year and he served as a fire chief in hinsdale and western springs illinois he's been a chief officer for more than 25 years and a speaker in multiple countries on the issues of May Day for mental health and he has articles published in the areas of mental health and leadership and fire safety and fire code challenges. He was awarded Fire Chief of the Year in 2004 by the Illinois Fire Chiefs Association. And just last week, he was awarded the uh, International Society of Fire Service Instructors, Instructor of the Year. And so privileged to have Chief Kenny with us tonight. And we hope you enjoy this interview and this conversation that we have. Just wanna give you a heads up. There is uh, quite a bit of talk about mental health and and the issues surrounding that as well as, as the issues of suicide. And so I wanna give you a little heads up warning that there are some really serious things that we discussed during this conversation. So be aware of that. And please, if you are struggling in your mental health and your wellness, please reach out to a a counselor reach out to a mental health provider to get the help that you need because you deserve to be well you deserve to live a life that is um, that is healthy and thriving and we want that for you so now without further ado here's my interview my conversation with chief patrick kenny welcome uh chief kenny to the ptsd 911 presents kenny or, or Chief, I want you to share with us briefly your story and the story of that you talk about in your book, if you could do that for us, please. Sure, I, I'd be honored to. So first of all, I, I want to just tell all of you, um, your story is just as valuable as what mine is. Something's driven you to be here tonight. And so please don't feel like it's diminished. I'm just telling you from one soul to kind of share. So embrace what you are speaking about what your mission is and, and really just take care of yourself. I also am a strong believer in there's no such thing as coincidences. Um, I'm a big, I have a very strong faith and I've been blessed to have a lot of signs in my life that things happen for a reason. And Conrad and I didn't even know each other. This ended up over a mutual friend who saw me sitting in the airport trying to figure out if I could actually edit a book and uh, came up and talked to me and we made this connection. So I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. So how did, what qualifies me to speak? So Conrad gave you kind of the fire service background education wise. Um, I graduated with a, a bachelor's degree in psychology. 
Um, my mother always said it was the biggest waste of money she ever did because smart people run out of burning buildings and my kid's got a degree in psychology and he runs in. So um, I'm not here because I have any more education probably than some of you. I have less education in that area, but I have life experience. And my son, Sean, was the best instructor I've ever had. And so I'm going to share with you lessons that I learned from his journey with mental health. So I was a pretty successful fire chief when Sean was first diagnosed with clinical depression at age of five. I didn't know you could have clinical depression at five. I knew you could be upset and throw a temper tantrum and be sad that you didn't get an extra scoop of ice cream or I grounded you. But to actually be diagnosed with the disease was something that was not on, on my radar. My own vision of myself, and, and I think it's true for most first responders, is I really believe when you're called and it's a vocation, it's, it's not an occupation. So whether you're a volunteer or whether you're incredibly well paid, when you get called to do service for other people, it's your vocation. And I believe for first responders, you get a cape. And that cape allows you to go places nobody else can go or would want to go and do things that nobody else can do. And that's the real positive side of that. The downside is, is that there are times where you can't make a difference and you get trapped in that. I, I always say that cape gets really, really tight at that point. And that could be in your own professional occupation or it could be in your family. And for me, it was, was in my family. At being told that at five, I had a son with clinical depression, I'm like, there's no way. My wife is the one who picked it up. She noticed that he was coloring in black, everything. And back then, Velcro shoes were a big deal. And so Sean would, if you interrupted him before he went to kindergarten, he would literally do 50 times in each shoe. An interruption caused what I call the temper tantrum. What I now realize was a panic attack. His anxiety was, was through the roof. So my wife took him to the doctor who then noticed the symptoms, sent him on to a psychologist who said yes and did a diagnosis. And so at the age of five, he started with therapy and medication. Now, I have to tell you, I was not all in at that. I took the easy way out and said, well, okay, honey, if that makes you feel better and this will just all blow over and this is fine. And really it went along that way until junior high. And for those of you who either have somebody in junior high or can remember back to when you were in junior high, um, chemically, your, your body is just changing so much. And if you have a mental health challenge, because if you get nothing else out of tonight, what you need to get out of tonight is, Mental illness is a physical illness. It's not a character deficiency. It's not a weakness. And it's not a choice. So if you disagree with any of me on those three, and Conrad won't be happy with this, you need to get off because it's not any of those. It is a physical illness and should be dealt with like any other one. But this guy that wore the cape, he didn't see that in his own kid. He wasn't willing to admit that. Now we're in junior high and the chemicals that had changed in his brain to cause not only the clinical depression, but at this point he was beginning to be diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder, which all I knew about that back then was I thought it meant that you washed your hands too many times. I had no idea of the depth of the pain with these intrusive thoughts and things that, that, that haunt people. And so when you have those chemical changes going on in your body, along with the hormone changes, it's really like putting gasoline on a fire. And Sean started to spiral. To the point that the day before he was supposed to start high school, we were on our driveway here and he said to my wife and I, I can't do this. And I, typical dad figures like, well, sure you can. I, I get it. You're nervous about the first day of high school. Your two brothers are in the school. Um, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. And he was like, no, I, I mean, I really can't do it. And my wife looked at me and she said, Pat, be quiet. I said, Sean, what do you mean? And he said, I, I don't want to live anymore. I, I can't deal with this anymore. Well, the department that I was part of was, was just a family department because we were only one station in a town full time. I knew everybody's wives. I knew their kids' names. I knew what they did. Um, we, we were really, really tight. And we had a local hospital that we would transport to. And we did EMS. And I can remember being on the ambulance as an EMT and we would get a, a psych call and it usually was two o'clock in the morning because nobody has a panic attack at noon. And you would go and it sounded like cardiac symptoms. 
and you would perform an evaluation and you would realize there wasn't a thing you could do for that person because it wasn't a cardiac. It was something going on mentally. And so you'd put them on the gurney and you'd transport to the hospital and, and Hinsdale Hospital was the one in our town. And you went to these bank of four white elevators and you would get on with the patient. You would go up to the psych floor, you get off, they would get off the gurney, they would disappear into a room, they would take all their clothes off, they would come out in a the gown, their clothes would be bagged, and they would disappear behind this door. I was standing there with my son saying basically that he was thinking about taking his life. The dad in me triggered, not the fire chief or not somebody with compassion. The dad triggered and thought, okay, I, I'm going to see how really bad he is. I'm going to give him the God's honest truth and scare the hell out of him. And I said, Sean, you realize by what I do, by telling me that you're thinking about you're going to take your life, I said, we have to take you to the hospital and they're going to end up putting you in the hospital and they're going to put you behind the door and it's going to be locked. And he looked right at me and I'll, with a stare I'll never forget and said, you hey, know, let's go. He walked around the car and got in the car. Now, I don't know how long I stood frozen on that driveway. It seemed like an eternity. But I remember thinking, oh, my God, I don't understand any of this. I didn't sign up for this. This isn't in the parent handbook. What do we do? So we took him to the hospital. And we stood in front of that bank of four elevators. And we went up to the fourth floor. And Sean went out, went in that room, took off his clothes. They were bagged. They were given to us. He was in a gown. And he disappeared behind that door. Now, he's 14 at this point. I'm going to stop and I'm going to tell you something that it's an important part in terms of my own understanding as I've gotten older and what he taught me regarding suicide. When I was 14, I was in a really bad car accident, I'm banged up really bad to the point they weren't sure I was ever going to be able to walk. And I was on the cusp of having a chance to go to high school and play football and baseball. And I had all these ideas of grandeur in my mind and, and they were destroyed in, in a few seconds. And six months later, my dad got sick on the day after Christmas and died on New Year's Day of a massive stomach hemorrhage. I was 14. A week after he was buried, I went to the cemetery where they buried him. I got off the bus, school bus, I could barely walk, got into the cemetery far enough and I laid down in the grave next to him to die. Now my mom, I'm an only child, hard to believe Irish Catholic only child, like those people don't exist. Well, I'm one of them. Think about the fact that, that my mom had just lost her husband in the span of five days, and now her kid is going to take his life a week later. Like, how cruel, how so very, very non-caring about your own mother. And I can tell you that at that moment when I laid there, there was nobody else on my radar. All I wanted to do was get out of that pain. My life was ruined. I had no hope, which is the common theme for anybody who gets into that point. There's loads of theories about suicide out there, um, but hope, loss is critical to any of them. And mine was gone. And I laid down in that grave next to him and said, I'm going to freeze to death here. It was, it was The wind chill was close to zero and it'll be okay because I believe he's somewhere and I want to go where he is and I don't want to be in this pain anymore. Now, after laying there for a few, what seemed like a few minutes, but it probably was a lot shorter than that, I heard for the first time somebody from the other side, which was my dad's voice going, you need to get up and get out of there. And I remember thinking, I'm hallucinating. This is working. I'm, I'm freezing to death. And what, it's not going to be long now. And then I heard it again, the way I remember him saying it when he was really pissed at me. I said, get up and get out of there. And I looked over at that grave and I went, Oh my God, there is another place. And I stumbled and I got out of that cemetery and, and I went on through high school. Now we're fast forward. I have a son who's almost 14, getting ready to go to high school. And now he's disappearing behind these doors with what I used to call all those other losers. Those people who can't make it, who can't cut it. But they have to lock them away in a room. But you know what the difference was? When Sean disappeared behind that door, all of a sudden those people weren't losers. All of a sudden, those were moms and dads. Those were doctors, attorneys, businessmen, firefighters who had a physical illness, just like everybody else in the other four floors of that hospital, except that I didn't look at it that way. But I did now. And then we, we, as we drove home, I can tell you, I've never been that sick to my stomach to that point in my life. And it wasn't because 
of Sean being in there. It felt like he was where he needed to be, even though I didn't understand any of it. But I was sick to my stomach about all those people that I had been on transports with and how I judged them and what a mistake I had made about who they were and what they stood for. Now we go through high school and it, and it, was, a, it was a challenge. Um, the mental illness got worse. The OCD got worse or multiple suicide attempts. All through high school, Sean was on a mission to find what medication or what intervention would help him and nothing worked. In fact, many of the interventions made him worse. To the point that finally, as we're getting towards the end of high school, he came to us and said, I really need some help. And uh, frankly, I looked at him and said, Sean, I don't know what else we can do. Insurance didn't cover most of the cost of these things. So we were, we were in debt. We were in emotional deficit that we just couldn't function without worrying. And I said, what, what do you want us to do? And he said, I'm taking drugs. So what do you mean? You should know better than that. You can't smoke that stuff with the medication you're on. Sometimes it makes it more potent. Sometimes it negates it. How are you going to know if you're getting any better? He said, no, no, dad, that's not what I'm doing. I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm doing coke and heroin. And we have a tiny little house, still the house that I we raised my boys in. The best mom in the world. And none of us knew. His brothers, his mom, or I knew that that was going on. He said, you know, I know I can't keep doing this for the rest of my life, so I need to get clean. And I said, why, Sean? Why do you do that? And he said, because when I'm high for those few minutes, it's a relief. It's a way away from the pain. I don't feel the same way, but I need the help. So he went into rehab. Now, during this whole process, so we're now 13 years, 14 years into his journey from the time of five. I never told anybody at that family firehouse. Nobody. I had a tremendous opportunity to make a positive impact on the culture of what was a wonderful organization, but I didn't trust it. I didn't trust myself. I, I like to think that the reason I didn't tell anybody was I didn't want Sean to walk into that fire station and people look and go, there's the kid that tried to kill himself. There's the kid who's been in an institution. And I, and I do believe, honestly, there was part of that. But I think the bigger picture was the fire chief, the guy who wears the cape, the guy who saved the day for everybody. What would my people think of me when I couldn't even take care of my own son? So nobody knew we went this battle alone. Now here we are, he's going into drug rehab. So I had to tell my secretary and my deputy chief, both of who were phenomenal, I'm going to be disappearing tonight because he's in a rehab center that's a 90 minute drive one way and it's family night and I'm going to be gone and, and be back. He still didn't share it with people. He was 18. He was the only one that could have signed himself out of that rehab unit, and he didn't. He became like the dad, which was a pretty consistent thing for Sean to do. Even when he was in the hospital, he was great about taking care of other people, but he could not take care of himself. This good-looking, funny, strong, athletic kid that I saw, when he looked in the mirror, he saw nothing but pain and loss and afraid to go on another day. We took him to Mayo Clinic before this just happened to get him evaluated because we were so desperate about nothing was working. And after a week of a workup, they came to us, my wife and I, and said, he's terminal. So what, it almost was a relief to me. Like, I mean, you found something like he's got a brain tumor or something like, no, Pat, you don't understand. I'll give me an example. We bring 10 women in here to Mayo Clinic that all have the same breast cancer, same age, same stage, everything's exactly the same. We give them exactly the same course of treatment. Nine respond, fine. One dies. We don't know why the cancer doesn't respond to those treatments. Sean's in the same boat. He's tried everything and none of it's working. So what's going to happen is either we're gonna get lucky and there'll be a new treatment and he will have held on long enough for him to get relief or someday he's gonna take his life. And I said, well, he's, he's just a kid. And I remember the doctor saying to me, you have no idea what his day is like. He does not wake up in the morning and go, I'm gonna kill myself today. Today he wakes up in the morning and goes, I'm gonna stay another day. I'm gonna try another day. I'm gonna be in this pain one more day and see if it changes. So he comes out of rehab. We think we've gotten a second, a second chance on life. 
And not long after he came out of rehab, we just found out that this isn't, this isn't going to work. Um, there was another suicide attempt. So I had to have sit down with another conversation again that is not in the parents' handbook and said, Sean, you got to look me in the eye and tell me you will not try to take your life again because you can't have your mother find you. You've got a promise. He looked at me and said, I can't do that, Dad. He said, I can't tell you that without lying to you. He goes, if it gets bad enough, it's going to happen. So we had to move him to a group home. Try telling your kitty they can't live with you anymore when you know they are so, so sick. But I was caught between taking care of him and taking care of my wife and frankly, feeling like I was a complete failure at both of them. So he went into this group home for a couple of months. And all of a sudden, in March, we got a phone call in the morning saying he was missing. I'm like, what do you mean he's missing? How can he be missing? Well, it wasn't a lockdown facility. They did education. They did jobs. Wonderful people. Hearts all in the right place. And he snuck out. And he was found down unconscious with an overdose. And the hospital called and said, you need to get here right away. He's in bad shape. I remember walking into the hospital and, and turning the corner. And it was a sight I had seen loads of times on the ambulance, but I had never seen it with my own son. There he was on a ventilator. He was all ashen. He had aspirated around the vent. He was, he was, he was gone. And he just stood there like, this can't be happening. It just can't, not him. This is too good a kid to have gone through this. And the doctor gave me the DNR order. The doctor gave my wife the organ donation, paperwork to fill out. And we sat there doing this, looking at our kid going, it can't be. We brought in our family to say goodbye. He went up to ICU. And for 24 hours, we just had kind of a vigil. The end of that time, somewhere between 24, 36 hours, I don't honestly remember because I hadn't had any sleep and I was I just couldn't think straight. The doctor came in and said, hey, I want to rip up the DNR. I remember looking going, why? I want to rip up the DNR. I said, why would you do that? He said, because he's trying. He's trying to come back. We got, we got to give him every chance we could. I'm like, give me, give me that paper. I ripped it up. And so we started now a different vigil. And so for the next few days, they would try to take him off the ventilator. And each time it didn't work. So finally, they said, we're going to try one more time tomorrow. If that doesn't work, this is how he'll be, and you'll have to find a place for him. Now, you heard me say earlier that I had a great faith. Well, at that moment, my faith was now being tested to the utmost, and I was angry. And I remember going in the hallway and having a conversation with who I believe is God and just saying, you can't do this. You can't do this to him. And you can't do this to his mother. These two have suffered so much, and you're going to leave him like this? We're going to have to find a place for him where he's going to be on a vent? This is what it would take him. I begged you to take him. I told him he can go. His life's not for him. He's, he's suffered too much. Please take him. No go. The next day was St. Patrick's Day. Now, I grew up Irish Catholic family, both parents from Ireland. We had three pictures hanging in my house when I was a kid growing up. We had a picture of the Pope. We had a picture of John F. Kennedy, and we had a picture of the original Mayor Daly. Every time I walked past those pictures, I had to kneel down and genuflect. I have no idea why. All I know was whatever they said, you didn't challenge. So we were very, very Irish. And so now, St. Patrick's Day, and Sean loved St. Patrick's Day because we would have parties here, green cookies, and I'm ashamed to tell you, none of my kids were really good at math. But when it came to pouring a beer from a keg, they were all really pretty good at it. And he loved it. And it's like, this is going to be his last chance. And I was so sure it wasn't going to work. So here's big, tough fire chief. One of those awards that Conrad alluded to, I'd already received. Big deal. You're the fire chief of the year. But what the hell kind of father are you? Because you can't protect your kid. And so I hid in the hallway. My wife went in and my niece, Sarah, who was there, went in the room because I was sure what was going to happen. He wasn't going to be able to breathe on his own. And I was going to have to face my wife and find a place for him. And all of a sudden, I heard what I thought was coughing. I was sure it was a nurse. So I waited again. I heard it again. And I'm like, the hell is that? And I literally peeked around the corner like a little kid. And there was Sean off the ventilator. And he was staring right at the door with this big, beautiful smile on his face. 
And I had this obnoxious St. Patrick's Day tie on. I said, are you laughing at my tie? And he shook his head and smiled. Now everybody's crying in the room before I walked in. I took off for that kid, sobbing, hugged him, squeezed him as hard as I had ever hugged him in my life. And the nurses were like, you need to go home. You need to rest. We got him. He's back. So we did. We went home. Still didn't sleep very well. Phone rang in the morning and it was caller ID on the phone. It was the hospital. And I was sure before I picked it up that he had died during the night. He had had a lung puncture while he was when he, in the coma and all sorts of other bad things happened. And we didn't know how long he was down. And I was sure. And I picked up the phone again, very, very hesitantly. And I said, hello. And on the other end of the line was this very hoarse voice. Dad, are you coming to see me today? I'm like, are you kidding me? I go, let's go. We're out of here. Went down to the hospital and we walked into his room. He was sitting on the side of the bed. He was very agitated. And he kept trying to talk. I'm like, Sean, you slow down. We got loads of time to talk now, buddy. We're, we're in a good spot here. Just we need to rest. And again, my wife, the smart one, looked at me and she said, be quiet. She goes, Sean, what, what do you want to say? He said, Sean Kenny. I saw Sean Kenny. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, he doesn't know who he is. This is, this is exactly what I was afraid of. He has such bad brain damage. Again, my wife, be quiet. Sean, you're, you're Sean Kenny. What do you mean? He goes, no, 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 no. Looks just like dad, but younger. And my wife said, who looks just like dad? He goes, Grandpa Mike. Well, that was my dad. Now, he then went on to describe my dad as a man in his mid-30s. My dad was an incredible athlete in Ireland, black curly hair, huge build, just, just great the kind of build that you hope for when you're growing up as a guy. And Sean had never even seen a picture of him like that. And yet he described it in detail. And he said he had such big hands. And I remember as a little boy when I would walk with my dad, remembering his hands just engulfing my hand. And he said, we sat on this concrete bench. And behind us were all these advertisements. Well, my mom and dad, as I said, came from Ireland. Neither one of them ever got a driver's license. So we always rode the bus. And you always sat on these concrete benches with advertisements behind them. They didn't exist during Sean's lifetime. Again, a picture he had never even seen or heard me talk about. And my wife said, did, did he talk to you? And she, he said, yeah. He said, tell your dad I'm really sorry I had to leave him so soon. Now, we can talk about oxygen deprivation. We can talk about the drugs he'd already taken. We can talk about the drugs they used to induce him into the coma and say, these are all hallucinations. I'm here to tell you there is no way an 18-year-old kid would know what it's like as a dad to have to leave his kid behind, even if what he was getting was an eternal reward. And she said, did he say anything else to you? And he said, yeah. He said, Sean, it's too soon. You need to go back and tell your dad I'm really proud of you. Now, at this point, I've gone from standing to sitting to almost falling out of the chair because there's no way, no way, what he shared with me, he could have known except for my dad to tell him. And the things my dad shared with him and how he looked, he knew I, that was what I would know and it would resonate with me. That's my dad. So everything I had prayed for over all those years, from the time I, my dad passed all the way up through my career, about how my dad can see some of this. I was like, oh my God, he sent my kid back. Like, this is, we're good. We're, we're set. Now, this is a miracle. I'm, we're running with it. That was in, in March. By April, he got even worse from being down so long, he had a tremendous hearing deficit, um, horrible ringing in his ears. He was getting more and more depressed. And he researched a study that was in its infancy in Illinois, where they actually were piloting a program to put an implant in your chest that would help to block some of the, the nerves that were going to the brain and sending different chemicals with the hope that it would reduce the OCD and the depression. He was the first person to ever have that surgery. And we really didn't want him to have it because he'd already been through everything, but this was the last hope. So he went through it and it made him worse. Every time this thing would fire, his voice would crack. On Easter Sunday, he actually passed out in the bathroom and we were sure he had taken some drug instead of this thing activating. Um, so in June, of that year, he took his life with an overdose. 
Now he knew he couldn't take any more drugs. He died by suicide. He didn't die because he was a drug addict or overdosed. He knew he left everything laid out. He snuck out of the group home. He convinced everybody he was great. They let him go. Supposed to go with a friend to a movie. Didn't happen. He went off by himself and died. And we got that call that next morning. And, and one of the things that I, I really applaud Conrad, and, and I know from looking at some of you when you settled in on the screen, you deal specifically with PTSD. I'm diagnosed with PTSD. I'm not diagnosed from what I've seen in my career. I'm diagnosed from having to go to the morgue to identify his body that day. Those are the nightmares that I still fight that come back, especially when it gets close to his anniversary. And to go down there and see your kid on a slab and your wife sobbing and all, because all she wants to do is kiss him on the forehead. And it's a crime scene, so you can't do it. I don't know that I ever thought it was I could get that low. But as our Paris priest said to us and our, and our counselor said, you now have just a little bit of an inkling of the pain he was in every day. This is what he woke up to, that feeling of no hope and that feeling of such sadness and depression. So I went back, my job, but I also went back going, there's got to be some way this kid didn't die in vain. All these things that I thought I was so wrong about. A month after I'm back at work on the 4th of July, which most, most organizations have a big 4th of July parade and the fire department's a big part of it and our organization was no different. I went to the firehouse that day against my wife's wishes because it's a big family day. And Sean loved to go there on the 4th of July. He would drive me crazy. Most kids, if you say it's a fire truck, it's a fire truck. Sean knew what was an ambulance, what was the engine, what was the truck, and he wanted to drive each one of them. And she said, don't do that to yourself. Your guys have got it. You don't need to go. I'm like, nope, the guy wearing the cape needs to go. And I went because I could control that situation. I went because I felt like he still was successful in that environment. I sure wasn't as a dad. I'd blown that completely. And now I could go back and be comfortable for a little while. Well, again, misjudgment. Sat in that office and sobbed all day. All people, I walked past my window and I watched families and I could remember my kids going through there and the joy all three of them had. It was like, I'm never going to see that again. Well, the next day when I came into the firehouse, one of the lieutenants knocked on the door and said, Chief, have you got a minute? Which anybody who's all, ever been in an administrative position, you know, when somebody asks if you got a minute, it's never any good news. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, did you give anybody off yesterday? Because that 4th of July was always a mandatory recall day because we needed all hands on deck. I said, you know, I, don't, I can't remember my name. I go, I don't think so, though. So, well, so-and-so didn't show up yesterday. And more importantly, the last couple of shifts, he's been in altercations with people. And the last one got physical. I said, is he here today? He goes, yeah. I go, send him in. Now, I would love to tell you coming off, having just buried your son three weeks earlier, that I wanted to do anything I could to help somebody. But all I wanted to do was, was nail this guy with every single emotion that I had in me that I couldn't get out. So I had my head down reading through the paperwork and he came in and he sat down and as I started to go, you know, I'm hearing this from the lieutenant. He said, chief, do you want to know where I was yesterday? I said, I don't really care where you were yesterday. I go, let's talk about what happened back here in the beginning of June. And it, as God is my witness, I now heard Sean's voice as clear as could be. He goes, dad, you need to look up. And it startled me. And I looked up and this firefighter was crying. And I pushed the paper away and I go, where were you yesterday? He said, you know, Chief, we've been talking about Sean for the whole month and we wish we knew. We could have helped you. We could have helped Eileen. We could have helped the kids. I'm not sure we could have helped him, but he would have known he was loved. He said, but we really believe he is better off now. He's not in that pain anymore. But he said, I've really struggled a lot. And so yesterday I sat in the bathtub with a gun in my mouth because I wanted to go where Sean was. Yeah, the guy with the cape should have been sitting there going, my God, I got another chance. I heard somebody I can help. And all I was thinking about was, I want to just trade you. I want to trade you. God, are you listening? You can have him. Give me back my kid. And again, I heard Sean go, Dad, you know what to do. Just do it. 
So I called the psychiatrist, said, here's the situation. He's got to go in. She goes, will he go in the ambulance? I said, no, because of the stigma of going in front of your brother firefighters. She said, will he go with you? And I asked him and he said, yeah. So we drove the four blocks to that hospital. We stood in, four, in front of that four banks of white elevators. We went up in that elevator and he got off that elevator and had to take his uniform off and gave it to me. And he disappeared behind that door with all those other people who had those severe physical illnesses. And what I found out afterwards, again, small, tight-knit fire department. For three years, every time he lost somebody on the ambulance, and I'm not talking about somebody who died in his arms. It could have been somebody who had gone to heaven 12 hours earlier. He took personal time to go to either their wake or funeral or both. None of us in the organization knew that. His PTSD was through the roof. And if I had created a culture by talking about Sean from the time he was five, maybe I could have saved this guy's career. He had to go off on, on PTSD. And he still is in a battle because it's, it's not something that all of a sudden just goes away. But he has become incredibly successful. He's had a chance to watch his son go into the fire service. He had a chance to watch his daughter get incredibly successful. And hopefully, as I used to tell him, I want you to be able to walk around the aisle someday. He tells me, you really helped me, Chief. I, I credit you with saving my life. And I'm like, no, Sean saved your life. You know, I didn't do anything. You learned from him. And you guys talking about it is what did it. So now my, my goal and part of what, what, what the book was, was to spread his message. So I started doing talks um, in 2009. I actually wrote an article that a good friend of mine, Janet Wilmot, uh, talked me into doing. I'd read an article about a firefighter who had gone through cancer and read it. And it really resonated with me about the courage this guy had to pull a curtain away about, no, I'm not Superman and I'm afraid. And here's what you go through and in order to try and get better. And, and she said to me, why don't you do the same thing about mental health? Because it's the same thing, except there's a bigger stigma. So I tried it and a very influential friend of mine uh, who was out at the National Fire Academy said, you know, I read the article. He said, I think you should do it as a presentation. I'm like, are you kidding me? I go, it took me months to write that article. I can't stand up in front of people and talk about this. I'll be a sobbing mess. He said, well, here's the date. And the date was Sean's anniversary. And Eileen looked at me and she goes, you believe there aren't anything as coincidences. What's the deal? That would be the date. So I went. And it's the first one I did, and I prayed it would be the last one I did, and I'm still doing it 12 years later. Fast forward to the last part of this that's important for you to hear, I think. My wife used to come to all of my talks. And as you can imagine, sometimes when I'm, it's a really easy to share this in a Zoom meeting and not get real emotional. When I'm standing in front of an audience, sometimes parts of it really hit me. And I always tell people, don't put your cape on and come rescue me. Just give me a second. I'll get it back. Because if you go into that superhero mode, you're not going to listen to what I hear. And, and that message is from Sean. So we were doing these talks and in 2015. We've been doing them for six years. And I could look at the audience and see 75% of them got it. Yes, I get it. It's a physical illness. I get it. My, my judgment of people is wrong. I get it. 25% frankly felt sorry for me. And I'm like, I mean, we got to do something. I got to get through that 25%. And we put a slide together that I said would compare physical illness to a mental illness so they could see it's the same thing. And we picked brain cancer. Put that slide up. How does it come about? How do you get it diagnosed? What is the strategy to treat it? Does it become terminal? And frankly, in the end, if that firefighter, and I used a firefighter, but this goes for anybody, if that person loses their life to cancer, they're treated as a hero. If they die by suicide, they're treated as a coward, and their family is shunned. And people would go, oh, my God, that's it. So I'm feeling like we did it. January of 2016, my wife was diagnosed with brain cancer. And when I got the call from the ER saying you need to get her in after the MRI showed nine tumors in her brain with no symptoms except for a couple of things that happened in that December, I looked at her and I said, did we know? Why did we pick that? Did we know that was going to happen? And she fought for 11 months of what was the most difficult. It was glioblastoma, and we were told, can't do surgery, can do treatment, um, try and get a quality of life. And uh, we had a son getting married in November, said, we're going to try and get her to that wedding. She might even be better by then, but you're not going to have much time after that. So she fought like hell for that 11 months to get to that wedding. 
13 days before the wedding, my son, Patrick, and my future daughter-in-law, Abby, came to the house and saw Eileen. At that point, she was really could not use her left side at all. Um, we had given up on the chemo because all I was doing was making her sick and she wasn't getting any better. He said, Mom, have you still got 13 days left? He said, you bet I do. I didn't fight this hard to give up now. I'm going to be there. My brother-in-law, Terry, had taken her wheelchair and had souped it all up with shamrocks and green lights and everything. And my in-law, future in-laws for my son-in-law had gotten a hotel room that we were ready. We were going to strip and turn it into like the hospital room. We were going to make this work. Next day, I went for a run. And when I came back, her friend who was staying with her, who happened to be Sean's godmother, said, there's been a change. And I go, why didn't you call me? And she said, no, no, she's okay. But you need to go in and talk to her. So I did. And I go, what's going on? She goes, I'm not going to make the wedding. What do you mean you're not going to make the wedding? So I'm not going to make the wedding. I go, you just told Patrick last night. What's the difference? He said, I saw Sean. I go, where did you see Sean? He said, right there at the foot of the bed. I go, how did he look? And she said, Patty looked so happy and so healthy. I said, did he talk to you? And she said, yeah. He said, mom, I'm coming to get you. So four days later, she passed. And we had a wake on a Monday, funeral on a Tuesday, a rehearsal dinner on a Friday, and a wedding on a Saturday. And that wedding was full of more joy than I can even imagine to tell you because she was in the room. Because one of the things she made me promise was, you can't be sad at that wedding. This whole year should have been about my, our daughter-in-law and instead it was about me. They'll watch you. And if you're sad, they'll all be sad too. So you got to carry that. I'm like, are you kidding me? So we've been together for 35 years. That's the hardest thing you've ever asked me. She goes, you can do it. I'll help you. And the other thing she said was, I want you to write a book. Write a book. Are you kidding me? I struggle with Christmas cards. She's like, you have to do it about Sean. She goes, you can't be going to all these talks. You're working. There's only so many people you can do, and it's taking a toll. Write the book. Tell his story. I go, I can't. So how about if I promise I try? She goes, no. Write the book. And so that book never sees paper if I didn't give her that promise because I sure didn't want to pass over to the other side and have to face her and go, I promised and I didn't do it. Um, and so that's kind of where, where, where my journey's at. And as I told all of you who are sitting there, it, there's nothing unique, nothing really that, I mean, there are a lot of people who've carried a whole lot more crosses and have gone through a whole lot more difficult life than I have. The difference is, is that Sean motivated me to go out and tell people the story and don't be afraid, dad, to be vulnerable and don't be afraid to say you failed and, and share what I went through so other people can learn from it because really wonderful people suffer from mental health challenges, just like wonderful people suffer from cancer. And he said, your job is to smash that stigma. So go use that Irish bullheaded stuff that you've got and go out there and do it. And, uh, and that's where we're at right now. And um, I haven't given up. I'm not going to give up. Uh, it may take different forms, but um, I'm hoping the book will go out and help people who are struggling and, and help other people educate them about the mental illness as a, as a physical illness. And, and we really need to get rid of that stigma. See, Conrad, never give an Irish guy an open mic because, you know, <laughs> it's only an hour show and I probably could have done four of that. So. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. That was very moving. And I'm, and I know that there's many in this room tonight who, um, you know, were very moved by that. Uh, so I want to ask you this, what, as a leader, as a, as a father, as a, as a parent, as, as a human being, when you see someone else that may be struggling with mental illness or, you know, trauma, what should you do? What are some of those steps that you should take first to uh, to move them toward a, a better place? I think the first thing that, that, and I always tell people, and it was something that I did also, was we're all trained, and a lot of people who are on here have training um, to recognize signs and symptoms. So if you have a, a friend that comes up to you and says, you know what, I think I'm really, I'm getting old. I mean, I've had a lot of heartburn lately, and today I got some chest pains and shortness of breath. Well, you're not going to hesitate but to call an ambulance to get that person evaluated. They may or may not have a cardiac event going on, but they may be on their way to dying and you, you're going to do something about it because you recognize those signs and symptoms. We don't train people about what are signs and symptoms of, of mental health challenges look like. So for a lot of people, they just change, whether it's they start to drink more, they start to eat more, they start to eat less, um, but usually they withdraw. We don't understand what that looks like. So we don't approach them 
sometimes we don't approach them at all. We certainly don't approach them with the speed we do with somebody who might be having a cardiac, even though what they're struggling with could be as lethal. In many times we start the conversation by saying, are you okay? Well, any first responder, whether you're police, fire, dispatch, EMS, critical incident, stress teams, whatever you are, you know, if somebody asks you, are you okay? The 100% answer across the world in any language is, I'm okay. Because it's what we do. It's that key that we carry. We're not going to tell anybody that we're not. So the first thing I would say is if you notice somebody, if your gut tells you somebody's struggling, the challenge of the way the statement should be is, is there anything I can do for you? Now, so there's two paths this can go down. They may say, no, thanks, I'm, I'm, I'm fine, okay? And you can't continue to berate them that day and get past it. But you can ask the question the next day and the next day and the next day, every day that you see that until the point that maybe, just maybe, they'll open up. Or in the positive way, they may say, yeah, I'm, I'm really struggling and I'm wondering if it's even worth being alive. Now, many people have told me, well, if they say that second one, I'm going to go, can we start all over? Are you okay? Because I can handle that one. I don't, you know what, I don't know what to do with this one. And that's it. So in organizations, and, and I was just talking to Conrad about, about an incident that I was involved in recently, and, and the organization had nothing in place for it. They didn't have a chaplain. They didn't have an EAP. They didn't have a peer support group. So all of a sudden, this tragedy occurs, and people are trying to go, we need help. We don't even know where to turn to. So making sure you have a structure set up in your own organization, and people know what it is, and there isn't a stigma attached to it. Well, so-and-so went to the EAP. Okay, well, there's your credibility going out the window about what happened. Is it this, nobody's going to know about this, and we're going to take care of people. We don't have the money to do this comprehensive program. Okay, well, do something. Do something, because in this life, most of the people I've met, and it is true specifically for first responders, we recruit and we hire people who care. And then we expose them to the absolute worst situations we can, and we're shocked that it bothers them. No, it's like when I came into the service, they told me, kid, you'll probably hurt your back at some point because you can't perfectly lift everything the way they teach you in the academy. And when it happens, tell somebody, we'll send you to a doctor who understands what firefighters do. We'll get you treatment. It might be therapy. It might be medica- medicine too. And then we'll get you back to, on the job. We don't do that with mental health. And we can do exactly the same thing. When that hits you, whether you're depressed about something at work or you're anxious about something that's going on in your family or you got to put your dad in a nursing home, when that hits you, that's normal because that's who you are. That's a, as human beings, we're caring. And when it happens, here's what you do. Here's who you tell. Here's who you go see that understands what you do in your profession. You may need medication. You may need therapy. And the goal is to get you back healthy again, not to put a label on it. And that's where we have to get. And the last part of that that's so important to all of you is self-care. You have to take care of yourself. We're really good about wearing that cape and saving the day for everybody else. But we do a lousy job of taking care of ourselves. And I am the worst defender of anybody on the screen about that. I preach this. Have I gotten a little better? I like to think I have. I'm not sure my family would agree. But you've got to do that. You've got to take time for you where you put stuff in your emotional bank account because you're consistently giving out withdrawals to other people, which is wonderful. It's because of who you are. But if you don't take care of you, you're never going to be able to be there for those people. And they're going to be at a loss for that. And so are you. So a quick question for you. Uh, and if anyone else has a question, just either raise your hand or, uh, or put it in the, in the, in the chat comments so we can, uh, we have a few minutes left and we want to, want to honor uh, Pat's time here and, and uh, you know, kind of wrap this up here in a few minutes, but, uh, but, but chief, what do you do personally to maintain your, your wellness? What, what's, what's some of those practices that you do? So when Sean was going for counseling, I didn't. Um, I, I needed to in the worst way. So I learned from his counselor telling me stories about his courage, what it was like, and said to myself, why am I not doing this? So I have, I have a counselor that I see on a regular basis. I call it my, my oil check. I'll go in if I think something's going on and go, here's what I'm feeling. And a lot of times the feedback will be, well, think about what you just told me and and what you're feeling is absolutely normal. If it it goes away, great. If it doesn't go away, then we need to follow up on it. So 
having somebody that, that is a professional that you can bear your soul. Because as you know, sometimes just by getting it off your chest, that makes you feel better. So that's number one. The second thing I realized with me is I had to have a, a, a pre-plan basically to take care of myself. And one of the things I need to do is I absolutely need to exercise. What I've gone from, I kind of have a bad back. I used to be a long distance runner. I can't do that anymore. So if it's just to walk, and I used to say, yeah, you got to work out at least an hour. It's like, hey, if I can walk for five minutes, if I can force myself to get out and move, it tends to move those chemicals through my body and I can start to work through it. I will call somebody. Um, I'm, I'm blessed with the angels I have in my life, people in my family and friends who I can call and go, can we just go out somewhere and talk about this? Because this sucks. And I don't know what to do about it. And I feel like crap. So having all of those different variables, and then I have a, a priest friend of mine who I really consider part of the family. Um, he buried Sean, he buried Eileen, and he married my son. And if I'm in trouble, I'll reach out to him and go, hey, I got a problem with the big guy. I don't, I don't get any of this and I need your help. So I have to have different layers um, depending on how I'm feeling. And, and again, I'm, I'm just another guy and I'm just as apt as anybody to be very sad and depressed and that's just part of being a human being. It's being able, as my counselor had said, it's okay for you to be there, Pat. Be in that pain, sit in Sean's room, feel it, but you can't stay there. And you got to get back out because that's, you still have life to live. And it's, it's just great advice for anybody. Mm -hmm. So we have a question from the audience. Tricia asked, so how do you get the management of your organization to prioritize mental health? That's a great question. So first of all, you have to, you have to walk the talk. Um, if you at the top just check the box for a mental health program because it's what you're supposed to do or you listen to somebody like me and went, oh, okay, everybody in my organization is all up in arms about this. Okay, we'll put in an EAP program or whatever. Um, it's not going to work. So you have to, well, I say you have to normalize. So for instance, a couple of suggestions is it's really important when people are come, becoming part of an organization, you usually do an orientation, hopefully before they even pick up an application. Part of that orientation should be the reality of not everybody can do what we do. And when you step into that arena, you're going to take a beating and just know up front that that's going to happen. And it's normal. And when it does, here's what we do. If you don't get buy-in that they're willing to do that, it's, it's not going to happen. It's just not. Now, I always tell firefighters, however, they go, well, I can't do this, anything about this because the chief, you know, he doesn't believe in this. Well, that's a cop out, too because you can make a difference on the individual level. So having the ability and the willingness to reach out to somebody who appears to be struggling, you don't have to have a lot of training for that. And you can find out pretty soon in a conversation that somebody's in real trouble. And then that's the time you go in and knock whoever the supervisor is on the door and go, we got somebody who's in trouble and needs help. So what are we gonna do about it? Don't let that situation pass by. It's the only way, and what I found was, and don't give up, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So if you try and try and try and you keep getting turned down, just keep banging at that door because eventually it'll happen. I think that's so important. And so many people that we've talked to over the last year and a half that I've been working on this project, you know, have uh, are reaching up and, and, and starting those grassroots organizations and, and, you know, peer, whether it's peer support or some other organization like that, there are so many resources available out there. And, um, you know, it's just a matter of reaching out and to the right people. Uh, in the room tonight, we have Todd, Todd Jerry. He's uh, from Garland, Texas, and he's one of our advisory board members. And he's Hi, just a huge advocate uh, in in his region in northern Texas there. And and if you send me an email and you want some resources uh, through Todd, we can we can connect you to some some resources around the country uh, that will that will help you. So just a quick question. When you hear of someone who is perhaps you are maybe, you know, have suspicions that this person is thinking about suicide, is it okay to talk about suicide with someone like that? Well, that's a great question because that's one of the myths, myths that's been out there forever is that if you talk to somebody about suicide, you may talk them into doing it wrong. But if you think that somebody's thinking about killing themselves, the way you approach them is are you thinking about killing yourself? You don't beat around the bush. If you look at any of the research and the military models that have been out there, whatever, it's been proven. I need to hit you directly. And you'll be surprised about, and if you talk to suicide survivors who were hit between the eyes like that, 
it was the right moment, the right time where they went, yes. And that's the way that you absolutely have to approach them if they get to that point. It's got to be point blank and you can't hesitate. And once you do that, if they've opened their heart to you, you have to take immediate action. So whether you, even if you just put the national suicide hotline in your phone and you dial it and hand them the phone and go, I have somebody here who's really in trouble and thinking about taking their life, do something immediately because otherwise that window may go away. And no, they may, they may be by telling you buy themselves more time and it not happen, or they may go home and that may happen later on that very day. Hmm. So as a, as a leader, how do you deal with the death of a coworker in your organization? What do you do with the, the members that are left? So they, they, I mean, there's, depending on what was the cause of the death, whether it's, you know, if it's of natural causes, somebody who passes from cancer, um, if it's a line of duty death, it takes it up a little, it takes it up a lot more level. Um, if it's a suicide, then it's, it's really misunderstood completely. And so you're, you've got another level, but all of them have one thing in common. There's one person who's not at the dinner table anymore. And so your job is you can't, you're not God, so you can't bring those people back. But what you can do is have the door open for the people who are left behind to go, who do I talk to to work my way through it? Don't try to be the counselor. Don't, don't go out of your pay grade. But have a system set up. First of all, that in the immediacy, they can have somebody they can talk to. One of the biggest problems I see is we'll bring in a team right away that does a great job. Not everybody's ready to, to mourn at that time or to open up. Sometimes it's years later. That door's got to be open for all that time. And whenever that person's ready to come forward, they don't feel like, well, everybody else got through this fine. And look at me. I'm struggling now. It's like, no, you just took you this to get to this point. And we, we embrace the fact that you're coming forward. And you have to show people that you're willing to do that. Because otherwise, every, all of us think it's just me. I'm the one. I'm the problem. And nothing could be farther from the truth. Well, does anyone else out there in the room have a question for Chief Kenny? If, if so, just uh, unmute yourself and just jump in. Would love to uh, to wrap this up. If you have a question, uh, love love to hear it. Conrad, um, the other thing while you're waiting on it, I'll tell you as a leader that is important for anybody is you have to be vulnerable. You, you can't you can't show that you, I know everything and I've got everything handled because that doesn't that's not the way it works. So if you don't role model the fact that it's okay that be okay, then people are not going to be comfortable to come forward. Sorry, I meant to get that in. No, I think that's so important. I think that's a a, a mantra I'm hearing more and more these right. days is that it's it's okay not to be okay. And I think we need to spread that message far and wide and not only verbally, but just, you know, live it out. And, and, you know, when I'm not okay, you know, in fact, here recently, I've had several people ask me, you know, I'm working on this movie project, I'm hearing all kinds of stories from all different types of, you know, traumas. And someone said, Well, what are you doing, Conrad, to, to make sure you're okay? And, you know, I really started to think about that. And I thought, you know what, I probably need to go see a counselor. And just to spend some, just to take care of me so that as I'm dealing with this, it doesn't, uh, doesn't impact me in a, in a negative way. And so, yeah, I, I think it's okay not to be okay. And, and I need to be okay with that and be okay with, you know, looking for help. So uh, this has been a really fascinating discussion and just your, your story is compelling. And I know we have, looking at the chat, people are already out there buying your book and where's, so where's the best place for someone to get in touch with you or to connect with you or, or to purchase your book? So the, 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 the website, and I always laugh because I said, I, I promised my wife I'd write a book. I didn't say I'd put together a website. So the website is patrickjkenny.com. That's where you can contact me. Um, Amazon has the book. Any of the other major providers has it. Um, I hope you find it helpful if you decide to read it. Um, I will tell you the consultant kind of pushed me and said at the end of each chapter, I want you to put lessons learned. And I went, I don't want to write it that way because it looks like a manual to me. It doesn't look like a book. And she said, people are going to read it. And when they want it on a shelf, you don't want it full of dust. So if they have a neighbor that loses a spouse. You want them to be able to pull it off. They don't have time to read 300 pages. They don't have time to read a chapter. They can go to the contents and go loss of a spouse and read the bullet points at the end. And it gives them a little bit of guidance about what to do. I don't certainly know it all, but I can give you just a little bit of experience. 
And I will tell you the feedback I've gotten from so many people is, God, we love the way it's written. And I always tell them, I go, oh, if it was up to me, it wouldn't have happened that way. So um, that's kind of how you can get a hold of me. And please do. Um, if I can help any of you, please email, send it along. Sometimes it takes me a little while to get back because a lot of people have been, been wonderful about reaching out. And there's also a lot of pain out there. But I promise you, I will get back to you. Yeah. Well, I do really appreciate your your time and for coming on the program. I know you've had a very busy couple of weeks, and it's been a really pleasure having you here. Again, the book is Taking the Cape Off. It's available on Amazon or on on uh, Chief Kenny's website, so go check it out. And uh, also be on the lookout for our documentary. We're in the middle of production right now. We're hoping to have it done my dream is to premiere it on National First Responder Day of 2022 uh, to kind of tie it in with that national uh, thing going on. So uh, be on the lookout for that. And uh, if you care, uh, throw us a little bit of support and share it widely with your audience everywhere you go. And by the way, I want to announce this and we are going to release a brand new film trailer, teaser trailer on Sept in September, September 10th, I believe we're going to release it. So uh, be on the lookout for that. Uh, Chief Kenny, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And do you have any final words for our audience tonight? First of all, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to sit there and listen to me go on. Um, and I just want to ask one favor. If you're sitting there tonight and you're struggling, and it's one of the reasons you got on here, please take the time when you get off right off of this Zoom to call somebody whether it's a friend of yours or whoever it is, just reach out to somebody and go, I need, I need some help. Because the, the real strength in strength is raising your hand. And what happens after that is, and I've seen people on the chat talking about using care animals. And there's so many ways to make you feel better, but you got to ask. So please don't hesitate. Thanks again, Chief, for joining us. We really appreciate that you took time out of your busy schedule to spend time with us here at PTSD 911 Presents. And we hope that you as a guest have enjoyed this conversation. If you have, please leave a comment below and be sure to follow us on all the socials uh, here on YouTube, on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram at PTSD 911 Movie. Please follow us there. And if you are watching this on YouTube and have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, or please subscribe, hit the subscribe button, click the little bell, the icon that will notify you of a new video that we post. And to let you know that we are going to be posting a brand new movie trailer coming up September 10th. So be on the lookout for that. A brand new movie trailer for PTSD 911 movie. And we thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of the first responder community. If you are a first responder, thank you for your service. And if you support first responders, thank you. Thank you for supporting those who take care of us and take care of our communities. We hope you have a great day, great evening, wherever you in the world you are from. Be blessed and be well. <laughs>